If you've ever wanted to create online content, then today's episode is for you. I get the chance to talk about raising funds, getting work done, making important decisions, and how to explore new online mediums with none other than author, podcaster, and all-around extraordinary guy, Jason Heath. Jason is the founder of the Contrabase Conversations podcast, which has been running since 2007, has almost 700 episodes, and gets over 1 million downloads per year. He's also, of course, a veteran of this show, having appeared previously on episode 46 and episode 52. I'm your host, Sean Perrin, and this is the Clarinet Podcast, the show where I discuss all that's new and neat with clarinet, with the neatest people in the industry. I want to invite you to head on over to clarinet.com, check out the merch we have there. You can get some cool t-shirts if it's warm where you are, maybe grab a a sweater. And uh, also you can join the members section, which includes extended ad-free versions of episodes just like this one. And you can ask questions to upcoming guests. An upcoming guest that will be exciting to some people is Angela Miles Beeching, who is the author of Beyond Talent. Also, I'm going to be doing a lot more YouTube content in the coming months, especially in the new year, including an amazing giveaway, which I will announce at 2,500 subscribers. So head on over to youtube.com slash clarinet, subscribe and hit the notification bell to ensure you're updated as soon as new content comes out. Encoda is a new app that lets you stream, practice and perform tens of thousands of music scores. It's kind of like Netflix, but for music. Get a free trial today. Just search for Encoda on your device's app store. That's Encoda, N-K-O-D-A. Have you wanted to try D'Addario Reads, but weren't quite sure which to choose? Here's how to decide. Reserve Reads come in a white and blue box. They feature a traditional blank and are perfect for those who want to focus sound with the quickest response possible. Reserve Classic Reads come in a white and purple box. They feature a thicker blank that provides an expanded tonal color palette, clarity of articulation, and added flexibility. And the new Reserve Evolution reads come in a white and yellow box. They feature our thickest blank and have a heavy spine for added projection and exceptional tonal depth, warmth, and flexibility. You'll have to try it to believe it. Try Reserve reads now at your local music store or head to clarinet.com slash reads to buy a box right now. Take your clarinet to the next level with a new mouthpiece, barrel, or bell from Bakun Musical Services. With free shipping to the United States and Canada, 14-day easy returns, and expert advice, you can be sure that you're making the best choice for your musical needs. After all, the best time to upgrade your clarinet was yesterday, but the second best time is today. Use code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com and save 10% on your next accessory purchase. That's code CLARINET at bakunmusical.com. So directly from San Francisco in the United States, I'm talking today with Jason Heath. Jason, welcome back on the podcast. It is good to be here, Sean, and it's not the first time we've chatted. I was looking back on your show archives and my show archives. We've been on each other's shows and we've chatted about all sorts of things. And I just I love what you do and your creativity and energy and imagination. And so it's fun to it's long overdue this chat. Man, I guess it was three years ago now, but uh, I want to get a bit of an update since then. Where have you been? Where are you at? And where are you going with all of your different online endeavors? Well, what's what's been going on? Uh, the podcast is now twelve years old, which is crazy. Um, so it's you know it would be getting ready for uh, for middle school or something like that, you know. Uh, but it has it's been quite a journey. It's it's sort of morphed into something that I was I was really trying about three years ago when we were talking. I was really trying to turn it into kind of my kind of my full time job. And I, I moved out to San Francisco and I thought, let's just pretend this is my full-time job and maybe it'll happen. And it kind of did, but uh, what I've decided, and, and we were just chatting before we hit record on this, uh, I decided uh, not long after we chatted, so maybe two years ago, to think of the podcast as its own independent entity and it's sort of self-supporting and ads come in to pay for everything. And then I have my own career and then lots of projects come my way via the podcast. But then there's like the Jason Heath career and then there's the Contrabase Conversations entity. That's a very interesting take on it. I think that's something that I'm starting to realize now in my, I guess it's third or fourth year of podcasting. So my podcast is just a baby compared to yours, but <laughs> um, but that, that's something that I found. And I wonder if earlier on you felt like this too, is that um, my career in the podcast seemed to be kind of one and the same. And I do need to find a way to separate those because the Clarinet brand is, is definitely very different from what I'm capable of doing as a musician, for example, like Clarinet can't even play clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I decided uh, that I didn't want to try to monetize my audience to death. Um, that, and oh, I, they, they, people who are listening will be hearing ads <laughs> run on this show. So you are, you do have that. But I was thinking about really trying to double down and, and put out as many books as I can on the topic and put out and just try to like get people to get into my online course about this and that. And, and I did some of that and there was some success, but I, I, there's this beauty to me of just like having these conversations that are just, there's no business model behind it. We're just, I'm just learning. We're just chatting about topics and I just, and, and deciding to not focus on trying to get every dollar I could out of the podcast and just sort of let it be its thing and just have these conversations really freed me up. And something that I think the last time we chatted, uh, that I did in 2017 that made a huge impact was I got people to help. So I have now, mm -hmm. I believe six people helping on the podcast wow. and it took a while to wire this whole system together, but I, I chat with people. Then it goes to one of two editors who edit the audio. Then that goes to back in, uh, to somebody who assembles the podcast. And then that all goes to the person who publishes and promotes it online and puts it into the email and newsletter. And then that is all listened to and cataloged and archived by somebody who tracks all the different topics we talk on the podcast for future books and other projects like that. So I was, it was all on me <laughs> doing that, um, <laughs> 2016, 2017, and ever since the show began. And that just, I felt like I got my life back doing that. Totally. And you know, that's interesting because I tried that for a while too. I've recently kind of taken back the reins just to try and, um, keep everything in the direction I want it to move. And I'm also clearly not as organized as you. I, I had some trouble trying to communicate effectively um, what needed to be done. And also the timeframes kind of would expand when you have multiple people involved, right? So if you want to get an episode out, um, like with your six person chain, you've got to know six weeks ahead of time what's happening. Whereas, for example, today I'm thinking of recording an episode that I'd like to release tomorrow. <laughs> so I can't do it that way through the, the group of people. So although I would like to go back to that at some point, I definitely appreciate the help that I got. Um, for now I'm, I'm kind of trying it, uh, grassroots again for a little while to see how, how that goes. And it's interesting to hear about the, the, the money too, because I mean, one of the things about any online activity is these things cost money. Like you mentioned, you recently got a new camera and we're going to talk about your YouTube side of things in a minute. Cause that's kind of, I think where a lot of digital content's going. Um, but I mean, I imagine that camera was what a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks for a really good one with a, with a lens. I mean, these things aren't cheap. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so, so the, the beauty of however I ended up building this thing and, or we built this thing with the community that's behind it, um, is I, I just, whatever comes in in terms of ad revenue just gets reinvested into the show in some way. So that mm -hmm. would be, for example, yeah, getting a good camera and some gear, you spend $1,500 go to going to a base convention or something like that. That's going to be a couple thousand dollars. Now I have all sorts of other, uh, aspects of my career that have developed because of the podcast. So I work as a consultant for different companies, product manager for base for Eastman strings. That's a big chunk of what I do these days. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my, 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 I have a whole, my fingers in a whole bunch of different things, but I do try to have the podcast just sort of the, as it grows, it just, it, it, I just gets reinvested back into it. I love that. You know, I love that you said community too, because I think that's been the most interesting thing for me along this clear and neat path is that when I traveled a couple of years ago at the beginning, even to a couple of places, those were completely funded by the audience down. To, and, you know, to be fair, I prepared well for those. I, I put up the, the, what was it called? Kickstarter or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, that's the website. Yeah. And, but I put like to the dollar what I was going to spend and that's exactly what it cost me. And I think that if, you know, have you done any crowdfunding or in that sense? Uh, I've, I've, I have thought about it and I have spent many hours like on the Patreon website. Patreon is actually based here in San Francisco. I thought oh. about walking down and chatting with them. I, I, I'm sure that they've done that a lot of times for podcasters in the area. And I just haven't, um, I just haven't pulled the trigger on it. I just haven't, um, I don't know. I, I, and I know it works and, uh, but I just, and I've, I've, I was even having lunch with, uh, the founder, Jennifer. Rosenfeld. I hope I'm getting her name right. Oh, who, I know her. 
Yeah, yeah. And and she was telling me all the reasons why it'd be great to do. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do it. And then I went home and then I totally didn't do it. So um, not to say I won't do it. But for me, I feel like if I went crowd the crowdfunding way, I, and I know like here in the States, uh, public radio, they have, they are, they have donor support, they have advertising, they have it all. But just for me, I, I feel like I'm already uh, selling my audience on a lot of products as it is. I would have, I, I would have to go totally punk rock just in my own head and pull, <laughs> pull all the ads and a hundred percent listener supported. So just for me, it's like, I either want th- that dial all the way on or all the way off. So I've just decided, and I've, and, and also I seem to have the, the machine seems to keep running. So I just don't want to, once yeah. I start poking around and that's, that goes for also websites. Are there things I want to fix in my website? Yes. Are there ways that I could make the pro- podcast process better? Yes. But sometimes when you got something running, uh, there, there's so much energy invested in, in trying to like change it, that it's, it's better. I feel like I do better when every one to two years I dip in and like, okay, let's change my web host or something. Cause I know I'm going to lose like a week. You yeah. Know? Yeah. <laughs> Well, and I realize for those listening that I just kind of interrupted myself, I will come back to my point in a second. <laughs> um, but uh, also, this is an interesting kind of insight. Like, I know a lot of people are considering starting their own means of online um, careers, be it a YouTube channel or maybe their own podcast, not about clarinet, though, um, <laughs> or something like that. And I hope this is kind of insight insight that you can use as well. Um, but as far as the crowdfunding goes, like with Clarinet, what I've done with Patreon is I realized there's two types of listeners. There's those, and they've told me so through Facebook surveys and things that they just would prefer to have more ads to listen to than pay for the podcast. But then there's other people who are willing to pitch in a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. Um, and they, for me, what I do is they get an ad free episode that is extended. So it has a little bit of bonus content in it. It takes me only about five or 10 minutes more to just strip out the ads and publish again. But there's 57 people in there who all really are keen on getting that. So um, yeah, and if that's something that interests you as you're listening, like I definitely encourage you and, and you should know that they're all the ads and things that are here. They're not they're not on that side of things. So you can kind of pick the kind of value that you want. Um, do you want to directly support it for, you know, less than a cup of coffee? Or do you want to just listen to a couple ads and the ads I try to make super relevant. Like, I mean, Dario reads and Bakun clarinets. Um, what could be more relevant to a clarinet player than those ads? That's, that's why I don't do like the whole, this is sponsored by audible or <laughs> well, it, it kind of is. Cause you can still go try audible and, you know, through an affiliate relationship, you can support the podcast, but I haven't done like full length ads for that or for invoice to go or whatever else. It's just not a hundred percent relevant. And to me, that's important. Yeah. If you're in it for the long haul, you want to, you want to make sure that you're really like everything that I, everyone I have as a sponsor is somebody that I know that I've met with the exception for the first time ever. I, I, I'm using, I am using the app and code but this, that's the only sponsor I've had that I don't personally know, haven't met in person. Every other mm. person, every other company I've spent time with them. I use the, I use the strings. Diderio sponsors this podcast too. I right behind me is my base with my Kaplan's on from Diderio <laughs> and uh, you know, R- rosin company comes on, I use their rosin. Um, so I really try to I, say, you know, I only take things that I actually believe in. So I also don't have, yeah, like uh, stamps.com. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and it's not that those things aren't valuable too, but like, I don't think that stamps.com cares about developing a great podcast for the clarinet community. Whereas, you know, these companies do. So that's what I think is so great about choosing the right sponsors. But to go back to the, um, the, uh, the cr- crowdfunding for a minute, I see so many people coming on and they're like, Oh, crowdfund me my new clarinet because I'm a poor student. Like that's not a good enough reason. You got to give something back, you know? And, and so when I did the crowdfunding for the trip, it was like, this is what it's going to cost dollar for dollar for me to get there. This is what I'm going to do. You're going to get a, a nice video out of it and hopefully a bunch of content. And those relationships like us meeting, for example, are still leading to new content like today. So that was what I call a really good investment. And I hope that the people who contributed, you know, five or $10 to that, or even just a dollar or two, I hope they feel like they got their value worth uh, from it. And, um, because I, I appreciate it, but I also think that it took the podcast further. And that was kind of the point. Well, I've been moving in the direction of doing 
uh, ever increasing percentage of my uh, podcasts at events on location. And mm. so in four days, I'm going to Australia and I'll be in Australia wow. for 11 days. And so thank you sponsors for making that happen. Yeah. And, and the crowdfunding model w- is a, something that definitely would be uh, something that I, I'll consider in the future for trips like that. But uh, I'll have the opportunity to connect with probably 10 to 12 bass players and different orchestras, jazz bassists over there. I'm taking in this event. I'll bring my camera, of course, get some great footage of the Melbourne Bass Day, the largest bass event in Australia. It's its third year. And then get to put that out to the world. And so the way that um, the way that things have been evolving for me have been in I do bursts of interviews like that. I mm. went to the International Society Bases Convention. And I think I did 25 interviews. Oh my and then God. I do no interviews for like months. There is, there are. And so the way I've been working these days and I, I Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Phil have talked about this before. Uh, uh, they say, get ahead, stay ahead. And that's totally yeah, what, yeah. what I, what I do. So I, I go and I, I, so I have this like giant backlog of episodes and then I, I get, I try to time it. So I'm just about to get to zero when I have another big event. So I'm running out. I'm, I'm finally out of those episodes from the base convention that was in June. So here we are in November. It took me that long <laughs> to get through them. And then I've been doing some, I don't want to call them filler, but I've been doing some Skype interviews cause I knew I'd need to get over this like three, four weeks. And then I'll, I'll be set through like March of 2020 at which point I'll be in Texas talking to people. So my sort of, uh, my flow has evolved to like maybe three to five times a year, just going nuts on the podcast Mm -hmm. and then putting it into this machine. And, and what I have to do on my end, maybe one day a month, I sit down and all I do is the podcast and just like all the little nitty gritty and writing up stuff. And I just like lose that entire day. Um, but otherwise it's like, there is no podcast. Um, but what, what it's been a great that I, I tell everybody they should start a podcast and I don't care if they're bass players or not. Um, but clarinets shouldn't. (laughs) because it's such a great self-improvement project. So like I would, I would want to have all the conversations I have, I would want to have anyway. And so the podcast is just this nice framework in which to have that conversation. Well, and that's Uh, what I love about online content is like, and and especially why I like podcasts over radio is because it's, it's not that I like something that's less produced, but, and you know, obviously the podcast would be better if it was more produced in some ways, like, but I just love the realness of podcasts, like listening to two people talking. And, and it's the kind of thing I listen to when I'm in the car too, you know, things like contra-based conversations. That's how I found you was through listening to your podcast as one of the podcasts that I've been checking out. And it was, you know, it was kind of cool to get to talk to you the first time. Not as cool now that I know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but well, going back to what you were saying earlier, that that's so some of some of my best friends I have met through this medium and our relationships yeah. have have blossomed as a result of this. And it's like this it's like this never ending well th- that you can go back to. Like like for me, I think of my podcast as like the Tonight Show. Not that uh, obviously that's like I don't know. But it is that scale. for basis. It is. Yeah. That. There's and no have, show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I have, I no, no. I have people come back. I had, I have had somebody come on seven times at this point. Wow. Um, because they just start doing new projects, or oh wow, we're going to be at this conference. Let's talk about jazz and what you've been doing. Oh, you've got this new and and so there's no. It's not a one and done thing. It's like and and almost all I'd say 95% of the guests I have on these days are straight from the community um, that I have, I have these, this spreadsheet I started years ago with everybody that's been recommended to me. And I even put like how many times, and then I lost that spreadsheet and then I found it again, <laughs> but I started another sheet and I've got, I've got, I could, I could do one of these a day for the rest of my life and I wouldn't even get through 10% of those names. So I realized, yeah. Oh, there's no end to this if I don't want. And, and so it's, it's just like a really good self-improvement thing. Like it may, it forces me to sit down, reach out, do some research, learn about something I don't know. And so for me, it's all upside. The only downside is time and yeah. money. You know? Yeah. Well, it's so funny because like, I remember too, early on, um, I had a lot of people on and I'm just over the hundred depth episode now. I think I'm at 120, probably 124 by the time this comes out. Um, so I'm just now thinking about going back and reaching into the people who I've told, let's have a second interview, for example, um, some of the very early episodes, like episode, you know, five or six, I'm sure there's people that I was like, Hey, let's chat again in the future. And I still haven't come back to them three years later, but, um, 
it doesn't mean that we can't. And I have started to do this. I mean, Stanley Drucker has now come on three times and uh, I never thought I'd get the chance to talk to him at all. So and uh, it's just super cool because even they sent me the, the latest CD they put out and, and I was really surprised to see this. But they thanked me in the liner notes as one of the people who's you know contributed to his career. And I thought that was super awesome. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, not to interrupt this show, but now to tell you about stamps.com, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's cool. So you're building the, the beautiful thing and you're into over a hundred. Congratulations, by the way. And, thank you. and I even looking back in my archives, episode 310 of my podcast was Sean Perrin on one year of podcasting. Yeah. So, um, and, and I'm at a 650 probably by the time this comes out. And, and I realized after I got over that hundred episode mark that I really was building an archive that mm-hmm. could be go- going back. And then, so that's why I'm so thankful. Krista Copper, who shout out to Krista, who does all this thematic cataloging of what we talk about, what that, what I have this Evernote document shared with Krista and the other people on the team. And when I want to look up a topic, I type in like right hand technique or whatever, you know, or, um, Homer Mensch or, uh, or trills or you name it. And I can find all the instances on all the podcasts where that topic has been talked about. And I've been starting to pull together these best of shows on top about once a year, I do a chunk of them. And then going down the line, two years, five years or something that I'm sort of writing a book by doing that. Well, and you so literally I, are. I, we had you on yeah. about your book. Uh, yeah, yeah. I write about, about the audition book. And so yeah. I'm realizing that, that, that this is just sort of happening as a result of the podcast. So it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting medium. And I love listening to podcasts just like you. I go out for my run or I'm, you know, yeah, commuting or whatever. And it's just like, it's a part of my day. And, and I, love the open-endedness of of the medium this has really been an incredible thing to get into so tell me about your your kind of working process because you seem like one of the most organized people i can even imagine um do you have like a, a like a daily method or like some sort of yoga that you do <laughs> or like how do you how do you keep your mind so focused well the the well i decided to and and I I have no kids I have my I have a lovely wife there and we no, live here in San Francisco so so and I decided when I moved out here that I didn't want to be running around like a chicken with my head cut off playing gigs two hours uh, all around San Francisco that's kind of what I did in Chicago so I just I decided I was gonna work eight to five Monday through Friday doing whatever. Uh, and I, and I started off just working on the podcast that so Monday through Friday, leave the weekends open. So like when I'm on, I'm on, uh, but, but back in the day I would be editing these things at four in the morning yeah. or at midnight when I come home or in the car before a gig. And, and so I've done it all. I've done interviews in the car, you know, outside in a parking lot, recording my cell phone to something. So, but these days I do that. And, and in terms of just the podcast, um, in terms of reaching out to people, it's total, it's, it, I don't really have much of a method. It's like, Oh, fine. You know, a lot of the time it's someone suggests. And then I finally think, Oh yeah, I need to do some episodes or I'm going to an event. And then I research who's going to be there. And I talk to them there, uh, in terms of actually doing these, I, I really enjoy the method I've come up with for doing these chats. And for every single person I talk to, whether it's a high school student, which I have interviewed high school kids or Christian McBride or somebody, it's the same process. It's like start an Evernote doc and just dump uh, it's total go- like going down every rat hole I can on the person and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and any articles or interviews. And then, and then some people there, I've talked to some amateur basis and there's nothing on them. Right. You know? And so I, uh, but regardless, I try to, I try to everybody I talk to, I try to do a, a decent amount of research and I'll do it. You know, it could be at least a few days before generally though it's weeks before for. And, and I just kind of, it's this just mess of stuff in Evernote. And then, uh, the day of, I open up on my iPad pro, I open up a blank sheet and I just take a few notes on like one screen on the iPad pro. And I do the same thing for everybody. And I only let myself write one page worth of notes, Mm. possible topics or whatever. And then that's it. When I talk to somebody, I don't, I don't look at it at all, but, but I have the pad there to write down little things that come into my mind or that sort of thing. And I have, 
all that saved in Evernote. And I love that because I just chatted with one of the Los Angeles Philharmonic bassists. Well, I talked to him 400 episodes ago. And it's so cool to be able to call up those old notes in in Evernote. And oh yeah, we talked about this, we talked about that. Oh, there's the link to his old album, boom, listening to it. And so that building an archive kind of thing, I wish I could grant public access to my Contrabase Conversations published folder. You know, I I, I, the, my, I I have too many personal cell phone numbers in there for that to work. But, <laughs> but um, it's Well, there's so an idea for your Patreon though. You know, if you were, people supported the show, maybe they could get some bonus content like that, yeah. you know, with the personal info stripped out, something like that. Yeah, see, now you got me thinking about the Patreon again. I, 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 I'm going to be, I'm going to be, yeah, I know, I know. Well, I got This is the thing yeah. too, because I remember when I first started the podcast, I was super like, uh, I think people underestimate, um, what's the word, the, uh, the pressure it felt like at the beginning, because I wanted to do a good job. And I'd also never done interviews before and I'd never made a podcast before and I, I'd never met these people before and I wanted them to take me seriously. So I would do like a day of research and same thing, have like all these questions, like a scripted sort of path for the interview I hopes to go down. And, um, and nowadays I don't do that because I find it's better just to get to know kind of the person and same thing. I write a one sheet and I just work from that because I find it's better to just let the conversation flow and know what I'm talking about. Um, but the ironic thing is when I started doing that, like literally the episode I started doing that, someone contacted me and said, you know, the show used to be so good, but now it's so scripted and I don't like that. And I was like, well, you might be surprised to learn that it's actually the opposite now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny. It, it makes me remember if you think back to when you started clarinet versus where you are, where you are now or me. I got into conducting a few years ago and like I was bad for years. You know, you yeah. have to, it's just it's a skill that you practice. I was a bad interviewer when I, when I when I started this show. Like like it's super awkward to listen to those early episodes. Oh, not I hate them I, too. Mine, yeah, mine not, I mean. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. And so it's, it's, but it's a skill you develop and I think it's a great skill. It's it, po- doing a podcast d- develops skills that you can use in other areas of your life really well. It makes you a better public speaker. I think it may, it, it, it forces you to actually listen and, th- and, and, and it's just, it develops a lot of skills that can apply in lots of business settings, musical settings. I have gotten to be such a less um and ah person as a result of this. Mm, I still say <laughs> um and ah, but oh yeah. my goodness, you should have heard it back in the, in the day. Yeah, I've been, I listen back and my big problem word that I tend to say is absolutely. The number of times <laughs> I've deleted the word absolutely from a podcast is, is just absolutely appalling. But um, <laughs> it's, it's true. It's really bad. And I, I've, I, but I now listen more to my own speech too when I'm talking. And um, it's made me a better clinician for sure. I go to you know schools or to present to people about the instrument and, and it's, you listen to what you're saying. I know that sounds kind of dumb, but you're, you do pay attention to what's coming out of your mouth, which is a pretty important skill. Here's, here's something that happens to me a lot. I I get up and this is usually when I'm doing Skype chats. This did not happen today, by the way, because we're friends and I know, but a lot of the time I'm like, I'm like, God, I don't want to do an interview today. I really don't want to do it. And, 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 and and it's like, and and I don't know why I say that. I think part of it's like, there's always like a little bit of fear is the wrong word, but like a little anxiety maybe about doing it, which is good. It's like going on stage or something. And every time when I get done, I say to myself, and I've said this every time, that's the best possible use of my time. That's the best thing I could have done with my time is sit down and chat with that person and really get to know them. And I, that I have that happen so much. It's like, uh, interview day. Yeah. Dang it. Why did I, why did I schedule an interview yeah, today? Uh, yeah. And then I get on and then I do it. I'm just so happy I did. So I know, and that happens to, to me with trips too. Like this Australia trip coming up in four days. I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I want to go to Australia. I don't want to get on a plane for 17 hours. Yeah. I like, and I know as soon as I get there, I'm going to be like, Oh, this is the best thing I could have done with my time. I come back. This is the best thing I could have done with my time. So that's just me with this stuff. Do you ever have the sensation that you recorded a podcast and at, when you're done, you realize, or you think to yourself that it, Oh my God, that didn't go that well. Um, and then you listen back later and it's actually like one of the best that you've ever done or <laughs> this kind of thing. I have this all the time. Yes, it, it that I, that absolutely. I, and I have because I have this whole process and team built up. I have a really weird. It's so different than it used to be because I used to be so aware of what we talked about and everything. These days, I get done and I I close this iPad doc and it's like gone from my head. I I can, yeah. I can sometimes even barely remember if I chatted with somebody. But then I, every once in a while, I don't listen to my own podcast that much, but I do jump in every once in a while just to make sure that like. 
my podcast exists. And, and, <laughs> and I listen. And then like, oh, yeah, that was really interesting where we went on that path. And also I do also because I realize it's going to vanish from my head. I make sure to take notes about the topics we talk about. So when I do my intro and outro, um, I can remember what we talked about. Yeah. Uh, because I, I, one thing, one disadvantage to doing it the way I'm doing and having a team is I definitely feel less connected to the podcast. Um, like I forget who's coming out uh, every week. I'm like, Oh, I guess they're coming out. And I always make sure to email the person and thank them and send them a link when it does come out. But I feel for me that that was a conversation that I was just personally benefiting from. And mm -hmm. that happened at this point, like months ago, typically for the podcast. So I'm sort of living in a different reality than the podcast. My life is like time shifted from my podcast. And it wasn't that way when I was like, chatting with someone, putting it out immediately. I miss that, but I couldn't be living my life the way I am now. If I was doing it all, it, it just wouldn't, it, it wouldn't work. <laughs> well, I tend to, even if it's not going to come out the same day, like this is probably not going to come out for a couple of weeks, but, um, I will probably sit down this afternoon and just quickly edit it and record intros and outros because it's fresh. Cause same thing. If, if I come back to this in a week, I'm going to have to listen to the whole thing again to get a gist of what we talked about and it's going to waste my time. <laughs> so you talk about like the best use of your time. I mean, it's pretty important to do things while they're fresh in your head. Um, oh yeah. yeah, I was I was in such a good rhythm, and I've fallen out of that rhythm. But I talking to you now, I got to get back into it. My I had for a little while, I had a really good thing going where I would chat, and then I would immediately go in and record an intro and outro, and then that and then that would go into into my Dropbox sequence, and I was good. And I don't know, I've for some reason I I think I've just got too many projects on my plate right now. It seems like every day I have just barely enough time to fit it all in. So I, so what I've been doing these days is I just like, well, like I said, take one day a month and it just, I just like, you know, that day is like destroyed, you know, it's nothing but podcasts. And so, but I have to do what you're talking about. Like, what do we talk about? Where did that, how did that happen? <laughs> so the notes seem to help. <laughs> well, you have to actually, and this is going to sound absurd for people who um, weren't trying to live the life I was living a couple of years ago where I was running around town and doing gigs and podcasting and everything you were talking about. Um, but I found that I actually had to literally schedule like this four hour block is podcasting time. And if I didn't do that, it would be three in the morning and I'd be up. And, and these days too, it's like, all right, this morning I'm going to get up. I'm going to get some work done for work. I'm going to podcast with Jason Heath for a couple hours. I think I'll probably edit for an hour or two. Then I'll do some more work. And then this evening I'll do some more work and then I'll go to bed. <laughs> but, but if I don't think like that, the podcast just always gets pushed to the side and it never really bubbles to the surface of priority because let's be honest amongst my job and you know, my, my child and need to eat. Like it's never going to be like, Oh my God, the podcast must happen now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's got to be so different with kids too. Like I can't even because I, I I'm able probably to have and I'm sure it changes as as kids get older, probably but um, <laughs> I, I'm able to I'm able to schedule my time, I, my my I can I can schedule my time without worrying about it, something somebody getting sick or something like that. So I, I take a screenshot of my of my calendar. And I usually do this over the weekend. And I and I, so I can see all my commitments and I put it into I use uh, notable on the iPad. I've used lots of note taking apps, but I do that. And then I look at that and I I block out through the week what hat I'm going to be wearing. So like mm -hmm. one day is going to so like usually if I do an interview, that's the day I'm also going to like bang out a couple hours of podcast stuff. Uh, related tasks like you're talking about. And then I actually get out of the house. I, I have, I would love to have mul a multiple screen set up. Uh, my place in San Francisco is too small for anything right now. So I actually go to a co working space a few days a week and I just, I just work on projects that are appropriate for there. So I'm not playing my bass. I'm not doing interviews, but I'm like, you know, whatever, doing research or emailing people about various projects or that kind of thing. And I, I love that. I actually go to Amazon Web Services. AWS has a co-working space here in San Francisco. Oh, I nice. love going there. Y Combinator, this famous startup accelerator is in the same building. And I just feel like I'm in Silicon Valley, the HBO show or something, you know, and so, so that's that I get really really good work done at one of those places. But then I have days that are all home and just base, or if I'm filming a video or something like that, then th that's going to be a home day. Well, it's important. And this is why I appreciate so much the, you know, the help on Patreon and from the advertisers is because they've allowed me to, with good conscience, um, say no to a lot of the driving around and stuff I used to do and spend that time on the podcast. And I, at first it was hard because I was like, oh, I'm not involved in the community as much anymore. But in a way I'm more involved. I just can't tell. Um, right. so how do you, uh, 
deal with that though? Like I, I'm not teaching or playing nearly as much as I used to. How do you feel like you're still an involved bassist? Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep, uh, I'm trying to I didn't to mean keep... that insult by that, by the way. Oh, I know no, that no, you're no. very busy. You're, <laughs> you're busier than me. <laughs> no, 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 no. But no, that's a good point. That's something I think about a lot. And I, I've sort of, what, what I'm doing right now, it's certainly subjects to change is I want to play a little and I want to teach a little. And if mm, I'm not yeah. careful, both of those will blow out of control. And, and I ended up taking on way too much in the teaching department last year. And I realized I'd made a big mistake. It was one of those things that I, I was just like walking through an airport, having a a conversation with somebody and they're like, Hey, can you fill in for this one thing? And I'm like, sure. Before I knew it five days a week, I was in the middle, middle schools in San Francisco t- teaching, t- coaching base. Like for, yeah. I, I realized, Oh no, I, I'm teaching, I'm teaching public middle school almost full time, you know, for not full time pay. Uh, what have I done? I, I said, yes, yes is a very dangerous word. So, so, <laughs> but, but I don't, I don't want to not teach at all. So I got rid of all of that except the one school it's one hour a week and it is, uh, I can see it from my window practically. So I, it's, it's go in, you know, so I'm doing a little bit of teaching. And I think that's healthy. I have a couple of private students. I say, I've had lots of people contact me. I always say no just because of time, except I've had these two since I moved to San Francisco. So, and then in terms of playing, uh, I'm get, a lot of the travel I do, I end up playing uh, as a result of that. And, and so I, I made, it sounds snobby, but I just decided if the San Francisco symphony calls or an equivalent gig, I say yes. Otherwise I just say no. And I was just playing San Francisco symphony last week now, which is, I, uh, you know, that's awesome. And I love it. So I, I do want to have some playing. I feel like I'm not, I feel like I lose connection with my artistry if I don't do any. Um, yeah. but it's changed a lot. I used to, like you were talking about dry, you know, I was teaching, playing seven days a week, driving all over the place. I think and that was when we I, first talked, you hadn't moved yet or you were about to move. Um, yeah. And you were like in the midst of driving all over everything. And we, I remember thinking we had a very similar lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I started to do a lot of that when I moved to California. Cause I was just like, uh Oh, I got to earn some money because yeah. San Francisco is expensive. And this math is really bad on <laughs> what's coming in and out in terms of rent and cost of living. Um, but, but things started to, I started to realize, Oh, I have this limited resource of time and I need to be very careful how I use it even and and um so yeah that's been a, a tough balancing act and i i love the community i love being around people and so i it it stinks that for me the best use of my talents uh, in my opinion end up putting me in front of a computer by myself a lot and even yeah. though podcasting is social like we're talking i'm still it's like we're just in these rooms by ourselves and and so it's it it's also it's funny so much of what i do and I, and i know so much of what you do is quite solitary very different than like i love going into school and having all the chaos and all that but but it like you i feel like i have this this like jar of energy every day and i can allocate it to a few things and and i got to be really careful um so like i go in and I would, even if I went in and taught like three hours in one day, I would be like destroyed creatively. I just, yeah. and I think it's just cause I put so much into that or like even with playing last week, I wasn't able to do anything on, on the, the project now, but it was worth it because it was San Francisco symphony. But if I, I could easily have said yes to a gig that paid one tenth of that and was the same time commitment. And I'm guilty, not guilty. That's the wrong word, but I, I've done that a lot in my life. So it, it is tough, but I, I, I get sad if the playing and, and and teaching get dialed to zero. But if it's more than like 5% of my time, uh, I start to feel like I'm not spending my time right. Because I, if uh, here's, here's something I, I don't know if you've thought about this, but an opportunity comes my way. And if I can think immediately of five people that would do a great job of that, I try to not take that opportunity. Hmm. So like if someone says, Hey, you want to teach my kid? I'm like, sure. But I can think of five people that would do just as good a job. Okay. That's not the opportunity, but doing this podcast, I don't know who I would recommend to like do exactly what I'm doing in terms of that or some of the projects that I consult for. And so I try and now, now something like San Francisco comes up. I could think of a lot of people to recommend, but I'm selfish and I want to do it. So, <laughs> so, 
But that's kind of that's kind of been my and one more and then I'll shut up. I've no, also no, that, trying, that's exa- I was my follow up question was going to be what's your decision making process? So feel free to. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the the, invent- the creator of CD Baby and of course, I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, it'll come to me. Uh, but he he w- has a metric he uses for uh, choosing projects and apologize to my audience because they're here. They've heard this many times. But I try to every opportunity that comes up, I try to rank it on a scale of one to ten. But I can't use the number number seven. So, uh, I, that's a, because so why many not? Projects, is it too, too middle of the road? It's well, too wishy-washy. Yeah. Well, it turned it, it, this is, this is at a, the name will come to me, but, uh, the CD baby founder, that's his metric. And if you do that, it's either going to be one to six or eight to 10. Well, if it's eight, that's pretty close to a nine. That means you're pretty excited about that project. If it's a six, I mean, that's like almost a failing grade. Um, and, and you realize when you do that, how many things come your way that you're like a seven about, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty well, good. You know, I was listening actually to Garrett Hope's podcast, um, uh, called portfolio composer one time. And he had a guest on, I just can't remember who it was, who shared this really interesting method with me. It's like a triangle system. Have you heard about this? Uh, I, no, I don't think so, but I, I listened to Garrett's podcast too. Shout out to Garrett. But, yeah, um, absolutely. I, I actually, so, quick side, so I actually got together with Garrett here in San Francisco. We had some fabulous oh, Mexican food. Yeah. Like, oh, a, nice. like maybe three, four months ago, another benefit to this podcast com- community, uh, this sort of thing and these friendships that you develop from meeting people through this. But, uh, no, I don't tell me about this three, three part method. Yeah. So the way it works is that you have a triangle and you imagine in each corner of the triangle, one corner is, will this uh, activity or thing I'm being asked to do, will it enhance my career? Does it pay appropriately? And will I enjoy it? And so what you want to try and do is focus on opportunities that fill all three corners. And if you don't have any three corner ones, you fill two corners. And if you can't find two corners, you go looking for them because you shouldn't do one corner activities. Um, and I found it really interesting, especially for, for, you know, younger students is that like, you may not have the three corner opportunities. So while you're looking for them, you can take as many two corner ones as you want. Um, but you need to be pushing for those. And, and I found it's been super, super helpful. So like today talking to you on the podcast, like it's fun, it's going to advance my career. You know, the podcast is supported by listeners, all three points check, you know, going and doing a clinic at Mount Royal versus where I work, you know, I like to work there. It's, it pays appropriately and it's going to advance my career. Yeah. I mean, just like you said, though, I can't do too many or it'll overwhelm my other activities, but I do like to have the remaining you know, bit of teaching that I do and, and the performing and all that. But it also opens the door to like, OK, a community orchestra has called me. They don't have a budget, but I really love the piece and I'm going to enjoy working with those people. And it's a piece I've never played before. I'm going to have a chance to play. You can still do it if there's no three corner stuff around. And it, it totally frees up your mind to be like, oh, it's OK to not get paid sometimes or it's OK to not even have fun sometimes if you're only going to get yeah. paid and advance your career. Right. So it's an interesting system that I've really used a lot. It's a, that's a good system. That that is a very I, I really like that one. I'm going to think about that when when projects come up. There's a similar system that uh, you know Andrew Hits, the entrepreneurial musician. His business partner Lance LeDuc has a system uh, called uh, when you're evaluating whether to take a gig. It's got to be two of the three uh, meet two of the three criteria. And so it's either pays well artistically good or good hang. So it's got to be two of the three. And I think that's a really good one. Cause I'll, I wonder I'll if it's the, his show. I got it from then instead. Cause that sounds very similar, but I've kind of put my own spin on it over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that definitely particularly for gigs makes sense. Um, but I, yeah. but I, I thought about that a lot cause I've definitely, uh, I taken a lot where I don't get two of the three, you know, uh, one of the three, you're going to be sad. Uh, two of the three, three of the three, like for me last week, San Francisco symphony, boom, boom, boom. Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. but, um, yeah, well, it no, makes what good- seem, you know, very complex decisions. Some of these things like, and, and a lot of people don't think enough about the decisions they say yes to. I think it was Warren Buffett who said something like, um, um, the difference between successful and very successful people is very successful people say no almost all the time, something like that. And it's totally true. And actually on my little sheet that I was going to show you, I have a, a, a workshop calculator. So I know what I want to get paid. I know what it will cost me in miles. Like this is not something I just made up. This is what the actual cost is to me. And I'll be in the hole financially if I don't recoup that money. Um, so anyways, I have this calculator of what I should feel like I'm getting paid. And if it doesn't reach that, 
I, I have to say no. <laughs> that's yeah. that's that's yeah. the way I work. And I have like a little list of quotes on the side, like still feeling doubt, like read these quotes. <laughs> and so it's a funny little thing I made up in, you know, Apple numbers or something that helps me make decisions because I'm not good enough sometimes at making decisions for myself. I'm too likely to be swayed by, oh yeah, but I knew that person from whatever and I should do them a favor or, or you know, I have nothing else to do that day. That is not true, but that's how <laughs> you might feel. Um, so no, that's super interesting insight. Thanks for, for sharing all that. We've, uh, as I knew it happened, we've been chatting for a while now and we, um, have touched on a bunch of great subjects, but we still haven't talked about YouTube. So before we move on from today's conversation, I want to really just ask, like, you've done some great content on podcasts, of course, on the blog. Um, but you've also recently and more so recently been delving into YouTube. So what's that been like? What's the editing like? Were there any challenges and what gear you're well, using, any other you know, recommendations you have? Sure. Yeah. And for, for me, I'm approaching it. And I think this is a good way to approach any project. It's something I'm just looking to develop my skills. And if things connect great, and if not, I don't really care because I'm developing my skills. And I think that's a healthy way to look at doing a podcast or, or starting a blog or something like that. Um, uh, I have had I've like, like many people, um, who do what I do. I've had a YouTube channel for a long time. I've had one since probably 2005. And I have some videos that have done that have got a quarter million views, 300,000 views, something like that yeah. from back, from back in the day or from certain events. But I personally like, like, uh, Peter McKinnon is a photography, uh, uh, blogger or vlogger that I follow, you know, it has probably 11 million people following or something like that. I haven't done many of the more contemporary sort of style YouTube videos that, that with, you know, quick cuts and, and good B roll and stuff. So I just decided to get better at doing like visually engaging videos. And so that's been a fun process. And I realized quickly, uh Oh, I need a better camera. I was trying to do it with my iPhone. And then I had this zoom, uh, camera and everything just looked like garbage. Um, so I ended up buying a Canon EOS M50, uh, which is a mirrorless DSLR style camera and, and getting a few different lenses, did some research. I ended up getting the Canon, the nifty 50, which is this, uh, 50 millimeter lens. It ends up being like an 85 millimeter lens with, uh, when I put, because anyway, for reasons that don't matter that much, but, um, it, it does well in low light and it gets that really nice buttery, blurry background. And I got some lights and I've gotten some mics. And so I can finally get like me looking about as good as I'm going to look <laughs> and, <laughs> and get, getting the, getting good audio. And all of that is, is fun. And it's a major challenge in my tiny San Francisco place. You know, it's like, I have to sort of figure all that out, but I've been having fun getting better at storytelling through video. So I've been, I've been taking, I did one on how extensions work and I shot all this slow motion of me like moving around the extension and then the title comes up saying where I am and what I'm doing. And I went into Adobe Illustrator and made some kind of cheesy graphics, but I'm getting better, you know, and edited it all in Adobe Premiere uh, and uh, did the audio balancing everything in Adobe Audition. So I'm just trying to get better at storytelling through video and using Adobe products. And I don't care if it does well or does. I mean, of course I want things to do well, but I've had some that are total flops. I did one after it's incredibly time consuming after effects video where I had like this text bouncing around and it's gotten like <laughs> no views, no views. And I probably spent like 60 hours working on that stupid thing. So it's like, all right, I know they don't want that. So <laughs> not going to, but I learned some great skills doing that. And I, and I will probably use some of that for some video intros. And even if I don't, it, it, I just kind of think of it like a hobby and, it, but, but it is a hobby that I, it's, it's already helping me in some other things. Like I'm as a result of doing all this, my thumbnails for my blog posts are getting better because I've yeah. been thinking about it more. I'm yeah. it's, I've, I've started to take photographs on the weekend, which I never used to do going out with my camera. And so it's, it's one of those things that's like, it's good for what I do professionally, but it's also become like a fun hobby and self-improvement project. Well, it is Seth Haynes years ago who told me something that was like, um, he probably told you this too. He wrote that book, uh, make it, I think it was called as a musician or something. Um, making it. That's what it was called. But he said, show people the process, not the the result or something like that. And so I've been doing that too. I, if I go to a, uh, uh, something and I talk to someone, I take a picture of the event or something and use that as the, the blog picture instead of just, you know, the professional headshot, which doesn't 
everyone has a professional headshot. It's not interesting. You know, it's not, it's not really relevant to our conversation, or maybe I have a picture of the two of us at a clarinet conference. I'll use that instead because it's like such a more cool picture to kind of use, you know? And, um, so funny. I, I love the the content you put, put. I think it's great, by the way. Your editing is, is wonderful and the, 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 the video looks great. I found the same thing with my iPhone. I tried a couple of videos. It just looked horrible. And I thought it was, uh, and I'm also a little bit weird in front of a camera. I'm like, it's, it's different than the, um, the audio. It's the editing's different. Like, it's like, oh, I made a stupid face. I can't use that take, even though it sounded fine or, <laughs> you know, something like that. Um, but, you know, I wanted to ask you, and this is just super off the cuff, but I, I have been just addicted to YouTube lately. I don't know what's wrong with me, but if I get a free hour, um, I am just watching stupid videos on YouTube and not, not necessarily stupid, but they're often musical <laughs> in nature. But are you familiar with the channel called Davey 504? No, but I'll check it out. You have to check it out. He's a bassist. So slap like if you like Davey 504. Slap it now. <laughs> Do it now. Anyways, uh, ep Epico. No, I just wanted to be funny. He, he does this kind of stuff. It's hilarious. So he's teaching and playing the bass through like absolute hilarious comedy and memes. And it is the funniest thing. I think I've watched like 50 episodes of his hilarious programming over the past three weeks since I discovered him. And it is just so well done. And um I'm just like, man, that's hilarious. So, so what other bass channels do you like then? Cause that was, that was one of my questions is, did you know of Davey 504? But also if not, where are you getting your bass from? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, lo I love, uh, uh, discover double bass. Can't say enough good things about them. Jeff Chalmers started discover double bass. I've had him on the podcast. I've had, I think everybody he's got eight, I think teachers now that have done courses for him. I think I've had every single person on, I have had every single person on the podcast talking about their course and it's been fun to watch him get better. So he's got, he puts a lot of content out on YouTube and then he sells these courses and he's just, he's good people all the way. I'm actually going to the UK to film a course for his site in February for adult beginners. And I'm having so much fun building that out. Um, so I follow discoverable base. I also Scott's bass lessons is an electric based channel. It's yeah, I love that. extremely large audience. Scott's the closest thing. He's like the Peter McKinnon of, of electric bass blogging where he's got his personality comes out and he's just fun and goofy. It's funny because I can be a fun and goofy guy, but like, I'm not, I don't, I, I don't, I, the way I, I watch my videos and they're, they're just very serious and about, and to the point and whatever, but that's just sort of my personality in that medium. I'm not going to try to be somebody I'm not. Um, I think that's a super dangerous thing. Um, so those are the two I follow probably the most in terms of base. Um, people recommend a lot of things to me and I, I check them out and share them out on my blog or whatever, but those are probably the, the two that I've watched the the most fun, but I go down YouTube rattle and especially with this whole new camera thing. Oh my goodness. I've been like for going through Casey Neistat archives, you know, for years, years and years past to, to, I think I've watched every Peter McKinnon video and I've watched a lot of reviews of stuff and travel bag reviews. And I, I've definitely gotten into that and it's a funny editing process for sure. So different than audio. Um, for, for me, what I, the, the flow, and I, I don't think I'm going to have time for this until next summer, probably. So I'm probably done with this for a little while, but I was in this really good, uh, routine of putting out a Wednesday video on a topic that was about mm. five minutes long. And what I would do is I would start by writing a blog post and I love being able to repurpose things like this. So I would, I would write a blog post and then the, then from the blog post, I would like write out kind of, a uh, a uh, workflow of how to make the video. So by writing the blog post, I've thought through the topic and then I would write out like bullet points that I want to hit in the video. And I'd have those on the iPad, but I have to make sure I'm not reading off the iPad because I got to look at the camera. So it's like these little things you don't think about in audio. Yeah. And, and then I know I'm going to screw up a lot, but I also know that I have an editing process and I know what I look like when I screw up. So I've gotten really good at the key board shortcuts and premiere pro to just like edit all those little things out. And mm -hmm. I know that that's what tons of YouTubers do anyway. So I don't care if I screw up, I just stop, say it again, say it again. And I get this editing process, but I also need to think about what shots do I need? So I'm going to yak about the topic, but I don't just want Jason's talking head for the whole video. I want some of the base or I want, I put on my uh, 50 millimeter lens and I get some like slow-mo of me, like moving over my bow or moving over the music, or maybe I want to capture some iPad screen sh sharing or something. So I have to, I sort of think through what I want visually and then I collect all that. And then there's the editing process and generating the thumbnail and all that. It's, 
it's it's like it's it's a workload equivalent to what I used to do for the podcast. Um, so, uh, but now that tra- travel scene is season is heated up and we're into that. I just like if I have a free week in San Francisco, I can do a video. If there's anything else going on that week, I just for me, I can't do it. But that's sort of where I'm at. No, I love it. And, you know, I think that that's something I'm, I'm excited to get into, but I'm also nervous because I know it is a lot more time commitment. Um, and uh, but, you know, it's one of those things that like people seem to be gravitating towards video content and I don't blame them. I, I love it, too. And it, it can be so engaging if done right. Um, and it can also be done very wrong. Like I <laughs> have seen some channels where I'm like, oh, this is this is bad. Usually it's older stuff, though, at this point. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a, a tough thing. And I, I don't know if you found this, too, but I found one of the hardest things about producing content has been injecting my personality and trying to figure out how much to do that of. Um, and I was, I was listening a while ago. This is kind of random, but uh, the company called Bovida, which does um, humidity packs, you probably use them. They, they, they license the humidity packs to D'Addario. They, they make the, uh, the ones you put in your case. Mm-hmm. Went, you know what I'm talking about? Those humidity I know what you're packs. About. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. they make those, they have a podcast and they have two podcasts. I think, uh, I can't remember the names, but one is about like, um, their cigar industry. Cause they obviously use these for cigars in the humidors and they also use them for instruments. So there's one that's about like just general uses of the product too. Cause they know not everyone's into cigars, but I was listening to the cigar podcast and just to get a feel for, <laughs> I don't smoke cigars, <laughs> but, but, uh, getting a, a feel for kind of what different shows are like. And, um, one of the interesting things they said at the beginning of one of them was we want to create a cigar that not everybody likes, but that some people will love. And I was like, that is the goal of online content right there, because you can't be something everyone likes. You're going to be, you know, just a bland nothingness. And but but if enough people, if you create something just big enough of a niche that that enough people can love, it's the perfect content. So. That's a great way. That's a great way to look at it. And yeah, you don't want to be somebody you're not too. And you're, yeah. you also get, it's another skill. You get better at it. The more you do like my, fr- I, I, even just in terms of speed of it. Well, first of all, I think I, I only done like eight of these videos where I was trying, where I've been trying to do a good job making videos. The first one was, ter- looked terrible. I mean, I, I sounded fine cause I know how to talk on, on mic or on screen, but, uh, and, but then I, I feel myself getting better as I do them. And now I've taken a break. So I'll come back and I'm a little, I'll be a little rusty, but I'll get back into it. Um, I just think that approaching any project yet, yeah, it's not going to be for everybody, but the, the, you know, just, just getting something out on a regular basis and thinking of it as a self-improvement project is just such a good thing for anybody to do. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Seth Godin. I don't know if you follow Seth Godin, but one of the, he's a, a well-known person in the marketing world for people listening. Um, he has been doing a daily, blog for I think 12 years, 11, 12 years at this point. And one phrase he uses, and he started a podcast recently, which is very cool. Um, one phrase he uses over and over is here. I made this, you know, that's just Mm. such a powerful thing. And I love that every week, twice a week with the podcast. And when I can once a week with the blog, I just to these people out there, I just say here, I made this. Maybe you like it. Maybe you won't. But, uh, I think that that's, I think that's one of those profound things if you really think about it well it's one of the funny things too when you create something that people will love one of the you know yin and yang things about the universe is that some people are going to hate it too and you have to be okay yeah. with that being all right and what i was just going to say about seth godin is like <laughs> i'm sorry but i can't stand seth godin i've always been like this because garrett <laughs> garrett uh hope and i talk about this too and he's like you gotta read this book i'm like you know i tried it i just i honestly couldn't get through it <laughs> i had to get rid of it but we've just never seen i maybe should try it again but it's, Try, uh, well, if you haven't, if you haven't tried the podcast, give it, give I'll, a sample yeah, of the podcast. It it's, it's a fun, he, I, he may be, I think for some people, they immediately love him. For me, it was an acquired taste because I didn't quite, um, I didn't quite understand. Uh, and, but I'm that way with a lot of things. I've become a huge fan of the Joe Rogan podcast. I couldn't stand that podcast. Um, and, and part of it is, it, but, but I sort of came to realize what's good about what the, the, I, I now enjoy and I get a lot out of it. I don't listen to every episode and I definitely don't listen to ones that are like real fight oriented or bro yeah, oriented, yeah. but I, <laughs> but, but um, it's really, um, it's interesting. Um, I've learned a lot from him and, and a lot of uh, other people not in the music world. You know, I've learned a lot from Tim Ferriss and his podcast. I've learned a lot from Fizzle, uh, the, the online uh 
uh, I don't even know how to describe fizzle. They, they help you just build a, an entrepreneurial career. Um, I probably, and another 12 podcasts probably. So that's going to be the end of the segment for today, but I'm going to have uh, Jason back on next episode to talk about where we kind of finish off here today, which was being entrepreneurial as a musician and also building a portfolio career and just kind of the financial wellness side of being a musician. So thank you so much, Jason, for coming on the show. And I look forward to chatting with you again next time. Great to be here. Thanks, John. Be sure to check out Jason's website at ContraBaseConversations.com and uh, you can get his podcast anywhere that you uh, get your podcast, which I guess, are you on Spotify now too? Oh yeah, Spotify, yeah, Pandora so Spotify, now too. Pandora, yeah. the whole, <laughs> the whole uh, nine yards. So uh, thanks so much for coming on the show and we'll talk to you soon. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Clarinet Podcast. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode. I know sometimes they run a little long, but you know what? These longer episodes somehow seem to manage to get the best listener count sometimes. So obviously you have the patience for it if you're still here at the end with me. I also want to invite you to join me on YouTube. That's youtube.com slash Clarinet. I'll be announcing a really awesome giveaway. It's in a secret box right now on my desk. And I'll be opening that box and showing you what's inside at 2,500 subscribers. So head to youtube.com slash Clarinet. Also, don't forget to check out our sponsors. Bakun Musical Services has an excellent coupon where you can save 10% on your next accessory purchase. That includes things like the popular Vocalese mouthpiece. Just head to bakunmusical.com and use code Clarinet at checkout. The Dairy Woodwinds has their new Reserve and Reserve Classic and Evolution Reads, which you can check out at your local music store. You can pick up a box right now by going to clarinet.com slash reads. And our newest sponsor, Encoda, this is a really cool app. It's kind of like Netflix for music and lets you stream music scores directly to your iPad or Android device, and you can get a free trial. Just search Encoda on your device today. That's N-K-O-D-A.